Well, we know that's not correct. First, the teeth are sanded smooth. Next, a hole is drilled in the base of the tooth, and a metal rod is inserted. The rod is then attached to the jaw mold. But they still needed help placing the teeth in the jaw. The men turned to Gordon Hubble and his knowledge of associated Megalodon tooth sets to see if he could help organize the teeth. And we looked at all the teeth that he had and we put them together into a set as closely as we could. In September of 1994, the jaws were finally completed. The men loaded the jaws onto a flatbed truck and drove them to the museum at Arizona State. The results were astounding. While not quite as large as the jaws built in New York in 1909, it's clear an animal would have to be of massive proportions to carry a set of jaws this size. Well, this jaw is approximately seven and a half feet tall, and it's about uh, eight and a half feet wide, if I remember right, and uh, has about 254 teeth in it, all real teeth. Once scientists had an idea about the size and scale of the teeth and jaws, they could start to figure out what the body was like. The Calvert Marine Museum skeleton paints a vivid portrait of the infrastructure needed to support the massive jaws. But the next step was to create a lifelike representation of this beast. What would a creature of this size look like swimming towards you in the ocean? Dr. Michael Gottfried, who had worked on the Calvert skeleton, now felt confident he could speculate on what this beast might have looked like from the outside. Collaborating with artist and animal modeler, Jim Melly, a Meg model was born. I mean, basically, this kind of thing is, it's the marriage of science and art, taking scientific information and converting it into a sculpture. A 15-meter, life-size replica of Megalodon now hangs in the San Diego Natural History Museum. So after all the research, working with models, working with drawings, working with the actual specimens that we do have, here's the end result. What we think is the most accurate and the most biologically plausible reconstruction of Megalodon that's on exhibit anywhere. From the first Meg tooth found by early humans, scientists now have a stunning picture of this massive creature. Hundreds of teeth capable of inflicting terrible damage on its prey. A jaw three meters wide and two meters high a body at least 15 meters long. Megalodon was enormous in doing kind of an estimate of the size of this fossil giant, but it would probably have been about a ton of foot, so in the neighborhood of about 50 tons plus. Uh, truly enormous animal. The question now was not so much what did the shark and its jaws look like, but how did they work? Scientists sometimes look to the biting and killing behavior of the modern great white shark to try and understand how Megalodon behaved. Both sharks are thought to use the same thrusting, sawing motion to rip gaping holes in their prey during an attack. An expedition with Ryan Johnson into the shark-filled waters off Marcel Bay, South Africa, provides a rare glimpse of this behavior. Oh, look at that one. He's a flyer. Fresh fish liver acts as good shark bait. It's not long before the first strike. Yeah. Here we go. Here we go. Go! Thresh it! See, now you hold it. He's got to start doing his head shake. There he goes. Shake. Shake. Ah. Ah, just a little one. See, when he grasped it, he started biting. But then once he really got a hold of it, he started shaking his head back and forth. And that really what makes the white shark unique is that not only does it bite and try to grasp the stuff and swallow it, it starts thrashing its head back and forth and trying to remove pieces of the, of the meat or the prey that it's eating. But observation from the deck of the boat is not good enough for Johnson. To get a complete understanding of how the great white swims, you need to get in the water with the shark. New audio techniques provide real-time commentary on what Johnson is seeing. All of the great white's power for swimming is coming from his tail. But what engines this is these two muscle bands, two red muscle bands that go from his body right down to his tails. And they just work like two big pistons going back and forth, back and forth. And this makes it one of the most efficient swimmers and predators in the ocean. 
we did some experiments a few years ago in which we calculated the speed of breaching grade whites, see how fast they were coming out of the water. And these things were hitting up to 19, 20 miles an hour. Megalodon would probably have needed the same speed and power 12 million years ago. The smaller, more agile Cetothea whale, similar to the modern day minke whale, would have been a fairly common prey item for Megalodon. Still, they were a tough test for Megalodon's hunting ability. Although this whale was only one fifth the length of the adult Megalodon, it still weighed a massive 9,000 kilograms. Using its powerful tail muscles, the 15 meter carnivore rockets towards the surface. The whale may not have a higher top speed than the Megalodon, but it was more agile. With its awesome power and speed, the Megalodon had the ability to leap above the surface of the water with a 9,000 kilogram whale still in its jaws. In a matter of moments, dinner was served. With one quick kill, Megalodon had proved that it had the strength and agility to rule the oceans of the world. Megalodon ruled the oceans for almost 20 million years, but even top predators have to keep their lineage going from generation to generation. Most scientists agree that like the Great White, the prehistoric Megalodon gave birth to live young. The Megalodon probably gave birth to only one pup at a time. When you consider that uh, a neonate, a pup, would have been anywhere from perhaps seven to 10 feet long, that's already a very large shark. And those baby sharks were hungry. Uh, I can see no reason why they wouldn't have been born ready to attack larger prey items. A herd of docile dugongs, or sea cows as they are sometimes called, might be just the ticket for an apex predator's first meal. One of the other kinds of marine mammals that were prey for megalodon were the sea cows. They were dugongs, not manatees. Manatees are a more recent uh, evolutionary arrival. So dugongs have uh, tails very much like dolphins, uh, unlike the manatees which have the more rounded beaver-like end of tail. The mature dugong was about three and a half meters long compared to the baby shark's three meter body. Based solely on size comparison, the baby shark would seem to be at a disadvantage, but size is only one part of the equation. They are relatively slow, sluggish animals. This is a section of sea cow rib, very heavy and dense. And uh, you'll notice that there's this bite mark running across the rib made by the tooth of uh, a very large shark. The hungry baby shark rushes forward. One small juvenile dugong is slow to react and the shark is on it. A lifetime of hunting has begun. Scientists are also keenly interested in just how long was the lifetime of these giant sharks. In the fossil preparation laboratory at the Florida Museum of Natural History, Dr. Bruce McFadden and his students are doing cutting edge research into the lifespan and eating habits of prehistoric sharks. Scientists study growth rings within the relatively few vertebrae of Megalodon that are known to exist. This is one way to discover more about these magnificent beasts and their daily life. We count them just the way somebody would count tree rings. The lower portion of a shark's vertebra is known as a centrum. In Megalodon, centra are extremely rare. Scientists are looking at the few samples they have to see what else they can learn about this prehistoric beast. Most of the samples that we have indicate that Megalodon live somewhere between 25 and 40 years. It, pro it could have lived longer because it didn't have any predators. Estimates of how much the Megalodon needed to eat ranged from 600 to 1200 kilos of food a day. This high energy animal must have been consuming a wide range of fish and marine mammals to sustain its life. We don't know exactly what foods they were feeding on. No matter what they were eating, one thing is clear. These massive sharks spent the bulk of their lifetime in a never ending search for food. And 15 million years ago, Miocene epoch oceans were filled with a variety of marine life from which the Megalodon could choose a meal. Whales, dolphins, 
dugongs, huge sea turtles and hosts of fish filled the coastal seawaters around the world. The megalodon was probably eating them all. The most common group of whales during the Miocene was the cetaphir. These small whales ranged from three to six meters and were found in warmer coastal waters all around the world. A whale that fed on plankton, crustaceans and tiny fish, these ocean mammals were quick and agile despite their hefty nine to 18,000 kilogram size. Like the dugong, these gentle creatures were likely easy targets for the hungry megalodon. But Dr. Stephen Godfrey has one piece of whale backbone that may demonstrate megalodon was not always successful in its hunt for prey. Unfortunately, the surface of the bone is worn and the secret to what happened to the whale is hidden from sight inside the vertebra. So we've got it up off the table. Now, do you want the entire thing scanned or just through pathology? The modern CAT scan can help. Godfrey uses today's technology to look back some 12 million years. It reveals the severity of the ancient whale's injury. A compression fracture runs the length of this vertebra. Dr. Godfrey theorizes what might have happened when the small whale was attacked by the massive megalodon. I believe that this uh, whale was hit by the giant megalodon and that the intense impact caused the vertebra to experience this intolerable strain that popped the bottom of the vertebra off, pushed it forward, and the healing that went on here in this vertebra is evidence that in spite of the intensity of the impact, uh, it, uh, it survived. It is the story of one megalodon's missed prey opportunity and one whale's fight to get away. Perhaps this time, when the prowling megalodon looked up at the surface of the water, there was a pod of three whales swimming by, full-grown adults closer to six meters and weighing in at 18,000 kilograms. The megalodon positions itself under the whales for an ambush. The small whale wavers and the giant shark cannot adjust its trajectory. The megalodon's massive jaws miss their target and his head smashes into the whale's back. As the CAT scan proves, this time the whale escaped. The whale was lucky. In most cases, it was easy prey for megalodon. But 20 million years ago, there was another marine mammal that could match megalodon's aggression. This is a skull of, a, of an ancient whale called a squalodont, and these animals could echolocate, and they were probably top predators for their time. A squalodon would have been a pretty formidable opponent. Squalodon didn't get as big as megalodon, but they got pretty good size. Uh, 25, 30 feet, I think, would be a, a pretty good estimate for a reasonable size squalodon. Squalodon was a top predator, like today's transient orcas. If we want to interpret any behavior of an extinct animal, we have to look at modern animals. In the case of these squalodonts, we would probably look at the modern killer whale. Uh, whales have been known to attack sharks. It's not simply a one-way street where sharks attack whales. Squalodon, at a maximum length of nine meters, would not have taken on a 15-meter megalodon by itself, but they would fight. If the megalodon spotted a squalodon, it wouldn't have hesitated to attack. Scientists believe these marine mammals may have traveled in pods. Squalodon being a big toothed whale would have been a highly intelligent animal. Megalodon, not so much. Higher reasoning powers uh, in sharks, not as nearly as well developed as, you, as what we find in marine mammals. Even an enormous animal like Megalodon is going to feel this punch in the gills. This time, it's outnumbered. The first Squalodon may not survive for long, but the Megalodon has sustained a few battle scars of its own. Not all attacks were successful, uh, like all predators. Uh, only a certain percentage of their attacks actually result in killing a prey that they then consume. But prey species other than squalodons and dugongs may have provided richer pickings. 
There were also large whales swimming in the coastal waters of the Pliocene epoch, really large whales.